So here, right in the very opening slide, the slide we have the concept presented that there are three things to be brought together. And the thesis, if you like, or the proposition I'm going to be sharing with you is the idea that these three are working together today, especially, despite all, all the gross things, the violent things that are happening going around the world, at the same time there's a wonderful grassroots efflorescence of wisdom, global meditations, people doing beautifully inspired spiritual art, etc., etc. So I thought that out of those three things that we begin perhaps with science itself. And here's a little graphic which indicates how these three main regions actually have a place where they overlap. And that's the one in the middle to do with mind, brain, and consciousness. So here in the top circle we have religion and spirituality, philosophy and science. And where else have we had those three things put together but in the second object? of the Theosophical Society to encourage the study of comparative religion, philosophy and science. Mm -hmm. So nearly 150 years ago, this vision was burning strong and bright at the origins of the Theosophical Society. And so our themes are going to be where these three specifically overlap in explorations of the mind, brain and consciousness. Which of course is, is carrying out the third object, is it not? to investigate unexplained laws of nature and the powers latent in the human being. Now, I'd like to share with you that I do have a master's degree in science and physics, um, and, and it allows me to have a particular perspective when uh, talking about these things. Perhaps the most obvious one of those perspectives is that I don't have any trouble talking about and integrating spirituality into an understanding and a practice of science. I have no trouble at all. It is just in the way you hold those ideas and indeed where there is a conflict, it's usually because one side or the other is being rigid or dogmatic about something. On the side of science, it is where people decide to hold a materialistic, reductionist worldview, which holds that everything can be explained in terms of the laws of, the laws of matter and that consciousness is a byproduct of the biochemistry and the, uh, and the electrical phenomena of the brain. And on the religious side of things, the rigidity might be around insisting that one has to read particular scriptural books in a rigidly um, kind of historical way, believing that the world was created only about 6,000 years ago, etc., etc. Frankly, I do not think that the ancient scriptures were meant to be read literally in that way. So the breadcrumbs of, of the symbolism of ancient scripture, I believe, are there to awaken our consciousness to deeper spiritual truths. And that is very much the heart and the essence of Gnosis, which itself runs strongly through the Theosophical Society in different ways. When Gnosis is understood as not only intellectual knowledge, but it's also the experiential spiritual knowledge, which has come to people down through the ages. It is, I believe, the actual origin of the ancient wisdom. And indeed, we've had many, many mystics of different kinds down through history who've had the divine expansion of consciousness where they have felt themselves to be one with all life, light, and consciousness, and the divine. And today, we have many, many hundreds, if not thousands, of near-death experiences where people are spontaneously having experiences like that as well. So this is the new gnosis. People who are maybe meditating or lucky enough to have a near-death experience and survived it, often it changes their lives because they've touched the core of their being. So science, what's the scientific method? So as you can tell here, it begins with perhaps some observation. So some astronomers, maybe 80 to 100 years ago, realised that Mercury had a bit of a weird orbit. It didn't exactly obey all the all the equations which they knew about. And that remained as an anomaly. Nobody knew why that was so. But it turned out that a man called Einstein had an hypothesis. <laughs> he, formed, 
He formed the theories of relativity and other, other developments of that. And it had the mathematics which, when they applied it to the orbit of Mercury, completely explained the anomaly. So what did we have? We had observations. Nobody knew why. And somebody came up with a hypothesis. Then they did the tests where they compared the observed positions of Mercury in the sky with the new mathematics that Einstein had come up with. And lo and behold, that was the test of that prediction and it came up shining. That's the cycle. It may begin with a hypothesis, as Einstein did, or it may, on the other hand, begin with the observations. Biology, for example, is a good uh, case of where people working in biology, like Charles Darwin, gathered huge amounts of information about the birds and the different creatures and genetics. Eventually, was an idea that arose out of that. But they didn't really have a way of making it join together. But Science in more recent times has, has provided a good deal of those links in terms of the genetics and all the biology and quantum physics way down at the molecular biological level. And so we go round and round and round. It's okay to come up with a theory that doesn't work. It just means, okay, back to the drawing board, let's devise a better one. You're building intellectual models of how nature works. And you might think, well, this model is well and truly verified, like Newton's laws of motion, I have, have proved to be very, very good at predicting what cars do on the road and rockets do going, going up through the atmosphere, but they have elements. There are times when classical mechanics, classical physics gets out of its depth and it's not good enough. But now we have the more refined theories of, of, of quantum mechanics and relativity, which fit observed reality much better. But even quantum mechanics now is beginning to creak at the seams, it's beginning to strain there are growing numbers of reasons where quantum, quantum physics is a wonderful mathematical description, but now we're realising more and more that we don't know why it works. We don't know what's underneath. Many exciting theories. One is, is, is called process physics. And, and this man here, lives in Adelaide, has come up with a theory that integrates gravity into the uh, quantum mechanical description of the other three main forces of nature. At the moment, in mainstream science, we have gravity out there, which it's very hard to integrate with strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, and the electromagnetic force. And there are dozens, if not hundreds, actually, of other people doing research trying to integrate these things together into a grand, unified theory of everything. And there are many other ways, too. One of the others I want to talk about later, too, is this chap named as Nassim Haramain, and he's operating a school of um, spirituality as a as well as physics, like it's, it's all about the integration of, of science and spirituality. He too has evolved a theory, a way of integrating those four forces observed in the physical world of gravity, along with electromagnetic forces, two nuclear ones, which are the weak force and the strong nuclear force. I put this up because one of the strengths of the method of science as it's practiced today, which actually is a wonderful development, here we have a collective endeavour whereby we accept a theory more and more if two, three, four or fifty or a hundred people are able to replicate the experiment which supports it. And it's well known that the person who developed the tectonic theory of, of explaining earthquakes and, and the shapes of the continents of the earth really was hacked down in this way. But in the end, of course, as we all know, plate tectonics has now been accepted and, and it fits very well. Blavatsky spent hundreds of pages, probably in her literature, rebutting the scientists of the day who were not just materialistic reductionist types as we know them today, but they really did have a much more densely mechanistic worldview. Blavatsky wrote, and this her diatribes that within a few years the veil of materialism would be rent asunder. She wrote those words, and within those few years, scientists then discovered radium, x rays, radioactivity, and within a few more years it developed into an understanding of the, both the wave nature of light but also its particle nature. Likewise, even matter like electrons, which were built, um, I believe to be particles, have been proven to have a, a wave like nature as well, which appears in certain experiments. <coughs> All this blew apart the 
previously held worldview where atoms were regarded as little hard billiard balls of substance and they would bounce off each other in, in precise adherence to Newton's laws of motion. It's all, it's all they had. But they believed in it with um, dogmatic dogmatism and she fought battles with them because she was trying to introduce, introduce the idea that there are energies of consciousness, you know, that there are realms of causes deeper than the physical world. And she she about to do that. Well, anyway, this prophecy was one of her very few, which is that the veil of materialistic science will be rent asunder. And it certainly was. Over the next about 20 years, that, that charmingly naive worldview of the little billy balls of, of matter was completely scattered and dissolved and replaced by one where energy, vortices and fields are much more than the um, concepts that it's based on. Curiously though, the mainstream of science adheres to that worldview in, in also a materialistic reductionist way too. It's like a more etherealized reductionism, but it still has tended to hold that matter of the behaviour and the electrodynamics of the, of the atoms and the chemicals and the substances and the cells. And the nerve fibres of the brain and explain consciousness. Well, I don't think so. And if you go back to the ancient wisdom, of which modern theosophy is, is, is an attempt to represent it to the world today, right back there you find that consciousness is presented as equal with matter. Indeed, the ancient wisdom goes, goes further back still into the time before anything was manifested. And most intriguingly, if, if, if you investigate indigenous worldviews and, and creation stories, including Māori, different versions of creation stories, they too present us with a great darkness, like there was a time before there was anything. But it's just wonderful that you find that the ancient wisdom of the Māori and other indigenous peoples corresponds with the ancient wisdom, for example, in the books of Theosophy, very, very strongly. <coughs> and that there is a stage, a stage in the emanation of the universe where you have these two primary realities, if you like, consciousness and stuff, consciousness and space, consciousness and matter and energy, which as we know in science, in science today, matter and energy are very, very closely related basically being about different forms of each other. <coughs> and in the end you discover that the growing numbers of anomalous phenomena, psychic phenomena, which the reductionists have been calling anomalous for a long time, but there's now frankly a mountain of evidence to support uh, the existence and, and the reality of the psi phenomena. Interestingly enough, skepticism has its place. It, even though it's a Pain in the neck. It's, I like to think of it as, as like the immune system of the mind. But as we know with the body, if the immune system becomes hyperactive, well then um, it, it can be a problem. And we get the same thing in the world of science, where skepticism is, is fantastic. Bring on an open-minded skeptic any time, because they say, well, okay, why? You know, mm -hmm. but at least they have an open mind. Energy. Now, I love this picture. This is Nikola Tesla. Who's heard of Tesla in this room? Probably everybody. Just oh, everybody's heard of Tesla. He was quite some man. <laughs> he's quite a guy. Oh, he's quite a guy to have the trust to know that he could be nonchalantly reading the book here while these sparks were flying everywhere. But he knew, of course, that it was safe to do so. It's because that was a very high voltage and deep, but it was also a very high frequency. Uh, way up maybe a megahertz or but certainly a very high frequency. And the result is that that high voltage is able to penetrate the insulating properties of the air without any trouble. But because of the high frequency, it was no danger to him, a biological organism. The universe that we live in is extremely energetic. What if we could access the pure energy source of the entire universe to power our world and beyond?
The solution is all around us. Let's explore together. That beautiful little video is produced by the Resonance Academy, uh, one of Nassim Haramain's productions. The Academy has a number of highly developed educational programs in which they are endeavoured to integrate spiritual science. Tesla remarked, by the way, if you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency and vibration. People who will come to a meeting like this have already sensed something that has them questing and questioning. What is the deeper nature of reality? What is this universe? <coughs> And I believe it is the interior sense, or, or glimpse if you like, of, of the reality of a cosmic source and realm of wisdom. Pure truth if you like, or truth by the capital T, where it is the, the oneness and, and the isness, the, the ultimate connectedness of all things to which our minds can only aspire. Even theosophy itself and all those books there and the books of all those are just symbols attempts to capture a glimpse of this universal realm of the divine mind if you like to call it that way or the archetypal mind of nature beyond human consciousness in, in the body so the path of yoga then the path of a spiritual journey if you like to put it that way in the word is the evolutionary progression and expansion of consciousness towards a permanent state of realizing, comprehending and experiencing that blazing realm of divine wisdom whilst in the body, which seems maybe impossible, but we're told that it is, we're told that the sages of the past, those who achieved and accomplished, are masters of the wisdom as they did actually achieve that goal of the permanent establishment of the linkage in consciousness between the brain-mind awareness and the brain-mind awareness of the soul and the spirit in its oneness with the universal mind. So this is the way of the mystic. You've had our mystics all down through history. Christianity has them. And Rumi and the Sufis and all these other wonderful experiences of the divine realm down through history and a different the point is that there's a middle way to embrace knowledge like this where we hold it lightly. I'll integrate the parts of that that I can, the ones that make sense, the ones that ring true to my intuition. This is what we want you to do in the Theosophical Society, not believe dogmatically. So the mystic's way was as the lover, lover of God, the divine, whatever. It, it is an experience. We might aspire to love God. I remember when I was 12 thinking, I wish I could love God, but I can't do it. I don't know how to. <laughs> to. To try and understand what is the ground of all being? What is the origin of all things? Along that pathway which raises for us in our encounter with wisdom in our lives, how do we know? How much trust can we put in things? We had a wonderful woman here a few years ago. She used to like to talk about, about degrees of knowledge. So there's hearsay, then there's I think so maybe type of knowledge, and then, oh, that's really very likely type of knowledge, and then well substantiated, yeah, yeah that really has stood the test of time. <laughs> there's another degree as well, which is like belief. I, for example, out of all my inputs through all my life, really, really think that reincarnation is the way things are run. So these are the degrees of knowledge that we can have, which we are confronted with. If we go back to this here, like we're given this body of wisdom teaching, but we have to figure out our posture, if you like, or our relationship. And don't we have our conspiracy theories? And <laughs> mind you, talking about conspiracy theories, most of the conspiracy theories I've encountered too are rapidly being turned into conspiracy fact. So here we have these tantalizing evidence of, of, of really high 
technological art and consciousness capabilities. Stones carved to carved to thousands of an inch off in the way they put together the temples of, in, of the Incas and Egyptian. What was the technology? What was the consciousness? What were the tools? How did they do this? What was the ancient wisdom of those times? Well, great question. Not going to answer them tonight, <laughs> but we will explore them a bit more in the, in the meetings after this. So that really is the close of the organised part of my presentation this evening. This alone represents the way these three things, which are easy to regard as being independent of part, part being in conformity with synthesis. We have the scientific method where we formulate theories to test them, or we gather observation, test them in the peer review process. Why is it a bad idea to measure physics? Because we never enjoy action movies again. <laughs>